President Trump decertifying the Iran nuclear agreement, that kicks the issue back to Congress, which now has a 60-day window to make the next move. And though the United States did not actually walk away from the nuclear deal, the president is leaving that option on the table. So far, the move winning praise from our closest ally in the Middle East. Joining me right now is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Mr. Prime Minister, it's wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Good to be here with you. You congratulated and commended the president's action on this deal. Why was it so important for President Trump to make this move? Well, look, Iran is the foremost terrorist state of our time. It uh, hangs gays, jails journalists, subjugates women, and foments terrorism throughout the world and wild aggression in the Middle East. To have a regime like this, that is, whose economy is 30 times the size of North Korea, to have a rogue regime like that, uh, acquire an arsenal of nuclear weapons in 10 years time, which is what the Iran agreement now provides Iran to do, is a terrible folly. So I commend the president for taking a historic and bold decision to avert this danger in time. He could have kicked the can down the road. He could have said, it's not going to happen on my watch, so I'll just let it go. But he didn't. And he faced up to this danger, and I think he gave an opportunity for all of us uh, in the Middle East and beyond to fix this deal, fix it or nix it, because it could be very, very dangerous if it just went through. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned North Korea. I'm going to ask you about that in a moment. But the idea that he said fix it or nix it really surprised some people that he left the door open to, look, if Congress can't come up with something, we'll walk away. Watch this, Mr. Prime Minister. I want to get your reaction to this as we uh, examine these flaws in the deal. I am directing my administration to work closely with Congress and our allies to address the deal's many serious flaws so that the Iranian regime can never threaten the world with nuclear weapons. In the event we are not able to reach a solution working with Congress and our allies, then the agreement will be terminated. Mr. Prime Minister, would you rather see this deal terminated, or do you think they actually can amend these serious flaws that the president refers to? I'm focused on the goal. The goal is to prevent Iran from ever acquiring, ever acquiring nuclear weapons. And whether you could achieve it either by fixing this uh, bad deal or by nixing it. I don't particularly care which one, but it's the result that we want to have. And there are several key things that you want to make sure. One is that you don't remove the restrictions on Iran's uh, nuclear program just by changing the calendar. You want to see a real change in Iran's behavior. That's eliminating the so-called automatic sunset clause on restrictions. The second thing is prevent Iran from developing intercontinental ballistic missiles that are only useful for nuclear weapons. And you can do that. Uh, the third thing is uh, equally is to uh, uh, see that uh, you have real inspections. Right now, Iran, you know, Iran doesn't allow you to inspect military sites. Uh, it lets you inspect everywhere else. Well, where do you think they're going to hide these th things? So there, these are some of the key th changes that have to go through. If you get it, fine. If you don't get it, cancel the deal. Yeah, this is a really important point that you make because Tom Cotton of Arkansas is now looking at some of these flaws as a way to come up with a bill to actually change this. And it is the sunset clauses, insufficient enforcement, and the silence on Iran's missile program. Uh, so do you think that they will actually be able to come up with an amendment that Iran will follow. I mean, do you really believe that we will be able to start viewing their facilities? I think that what you have is immense leverage. People don't recognize that. You have immense leverage, uh, and uh, not only because Israel and the key Arab states in the region support what the president has done. You said Israel supports the president. Absolutely. But so do Saudi Arabia. So do the Emirates. And you know, it, when Israel and the Arab states agree on something, you know, you should pay attention. I, I think this is a, a historic moment. The leverage you have is based upon the fact that the United States is a great superpower. It's the world's greatest power. It, its economy is nearly $20 trillion. The Iranian economy is 2% of that. So when various countries, including your allies, have to choose between crippling sanctions on Iran or cutting themselves out of the American market, well, it's a no-brainer what they'll choose. That's part of the leverage that you have, and the president is right to put that forward now and to say, I'm not going to authorize the continuation of a very bad deal that will give a rogue criminal state 
the powers to threaten the United States mainland. Uh, we've seen what happens when that goes through. I'm going to act now. Again, fix it or nix it. Exactly but, the right thing to do. But that's not what we're hearing from some of our partners on this deal, right? I mean, what are you going to do? What should the president be doing to work with the other five countries who are basically saying, look, we're fine just keeping this deal as is. I'm talking about Europe. I'm talking about China. So if the U.S. even puts snapback sanctions back in place, what does it really mean if the other countries involved in this deal are not agreeable? Well, look, I think the reason they say they want to keep the deal is because they think that changing it would mean canceling it. But the president said something very astute. He said, well, unless you change it, I'm going to cancel it. So if you want to save the deal, start fixing it. And that's, that's exactly the right – so it takes time until governments actually understand uh, the significance of what uh, the president put forward. But he has said, I, the president of the United States, will not allow this bad deal to go through. So the only way you guys can save the deal is by helping amend it, fixing it. And that's, that's uh, something that I think will have uh, great leverage down the line. So you do believe that Maybe Europe, right for example, will join in on perhaps, potentially, snapping back those sanctions against Iran then? Well, I think if the U.S. decides to do that on its own, it can do so by its own because it has such immense economic leverage. And I think the Europeans, uh, once they think about it, will see that the president is giving them an opportunity to avoid something that is very bad for them today. You, you know, you don't want—none of us as leaders should, uh, you know, sacrifice the long term or even the middle term for the short term. In the short term, yeah, it's comfortable. They, they have— uh, business ties with Iran and so on that are developing. But in a very few years, Iran will be this uh, humongous power with, with declared, uh, you know, this is Iran that says death to America, death to Israel. You know, you're the great Satan, we're the little Satan. I suppose Europe in between is a middle sized Satan. I hope they're not offended. But we're all under their guns. They're developing ballistic missiles not to fire against us. They already have that. It's to fire against, to threaten Europe, to threaten the United States. So I think when people come around and think about it, they say, we, we really don't want this bad deal to go through. We really should act now to correct it. The, the president also said, look, their favorite term is death to America, death to Israel. The president actually said that in the speech. Are you expecting Iran to take retaliatory action as a result of this move? Against whom? Against the U.S., against Israel, against anybody. I mean, are you expecting a reaction from the Iran Revolutionary Guard? Well, I, I think I can speak as the Prime Minister of Israel. I think if they act against us, that would be a very big mistake. Already we've heard rhetoric to that, calling any commentary against this deal stupid. I mean, a lot of commentary already coming out of Iran. Should, should the country be afraid? I mean, should we be worried that, in fact, this is going to stoke even more violence? No, I think it's the opposite. I, I think it reveals Iran's the, the pressure that Iran has come under. Up to now, they, they were living in heaven. I mean, the, the radicals who control Iran were enjoying a bonanza. They were getting money flowing in. It just began, by the way. Fifty billion that they got in is just up front. But down the line, they'd get hundreds of billions of dollars with oil contracts, with projects and other things. And so all of a sudden, this bonanza has stopped. And now they're under pressure. And I think that's important. Uh, look, I drew a red line in the U.N. Uh, against Iranian enrichment. Uh, and uh, everybody said, wow, you know, is that going to cause a problem? But in fact, Iran backed off. They never crossed that line because they know the power of crippling sanctions and other things that they would have to confront. So I, I would say right now the the ones who are worried, who should be worried is Iran, not the U.S. You know, the, uh, the president also mentioned North Korea. You mentioned North Korea at the beginning of our, our conversation. He said, look, if you allow something to keep going on, it will only get worse. It will only get busy, uh, worse at, at, and uh, more dangerous, as we've seen with North Korea. Do you believe Iran is working with North Korea on uh, its missile program? Well, it did in the past, for sure. Uh, there, there's no question about that. Uh, but I'd rather not discuss ongoing uh, intelligence. Uh, I think the important thing is, you remember that when the deal with North Korea was signed in 1994, it was hailed as, uh, you know, it's just a breakthrough. Uh, 
uh, North Korea's uh, neighbors would be more secure, North Korea will stop the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, that turned out to be uh, false. And in fact, the same celebratory words were said about the deal with Iran, including the fact that uh, Iran would now join the community of nations. It's going to moderate it, its activity. But since the deal with Iran was signed, the nuclear deal was signed, right. Iran is, has been like a tiger unleashed from its cage. And it's not joining the community of nations, it's devouring nations left and right. So I, I think that standing up to, you know, refusing right. to go along with a bad deal uh, is a good thing, an important thing, even a historic thing. Uh, certainly important for world peace. And, and Mr. Prime Minister, real quick, we're about to speak with Stephen Mnuchin, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, and of course this deal gives the Treasury uh, further a sanction opportunity against uh, the Revolutionary Guard uh, because of its support for terrorism. What do you want to see out of the U.S. Treasury right now? That, that is a very important step, and I, I welcome it. We'd like to see it implemented, obviously, because uh, because the Revolutionary Guards are the main instrument of Iran's aggression throughout the Middle East. They're firing rockets from Yemen uh, with their, through their proxies that reach 700 kilometers right into the Riyadh uh, in Saudi Arabia. They're uh, trying to uh, colonize Sy uh, Syria and turn it into a military base. Uh, against Israel and against others. So Iran's aggression continues unabated and, in fact, fueled by the megabucks that they received from this deal. And that's nothing compared to what they'll receive tomorrow unless we change course. Well, Beginning those sanctions on the yeah. Revolutionary Guards is a very important first step. You make an important point because the land grab has gotten bigger. Iran is in Syria. It is in Iraq. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Maria. Congratulations you. to, to you on this uh, dynamic economy uh, of Israel, despite the uh, challenges you face. We'll see you soon, sir. It's a roaring tiger. Come and invest. <laughs> Thank you so much. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Thank you. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. This is Jacob Prash coming to you from the UK this week in prophecy. Soon on our way to the Far East, but what a week this has been as usual. For the first time, there's been direct military conflict between Israel and Iran. After warning that Israel will destroy any Iranian or Iranian-sponsored bases within 40 kilometers of the Golan Heights and the Israeli line of demarcation, effectively the border, Israel launched five surface-to-surface -surface missiles, directly attacking Iranian forces, killing at least a dozen Iranians taking up positions on the outskirts of Damascus. Again, this followed on the heels of a series of meetings on a diplomatic level between Turkey, Russia, and Iran. Now, those meetings have not to date been meetings of defense ministers or generals, but they have been ministers, uh, meetings of foreign ministers placed on the site of the former Olympics in Russia. This diplomatic rapprochement that would very much give off the flavor of a potential Gog and Magog scenario in the estimation of many people. Again, it's been purely diplomatic, but there have been strategic cooperation meetings between Russia and Iran, and certainly Russia and Syria, and although unreported, without doubt, Syria and Iran, we know that there's active cooperation between the Assad forces and the Iranian Republican Guards. But this week in prophecy, Military conflict has directly commenced for the first time. Hello, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. I'm Aaron Porras, here with ILTV's Morning Briefing. We've just learned Israeli jets are believed to have struck a Syrian weapons depot near the Syrian-Lebanon border. Arabic media has reported massive explosions in the region, now believed to be four Israeli airstrikes, with eyewitnesses seeing Israeli jets in the sky. Syria has immediately retaliated for the attack, launching anti-aircraft ballistics. At this time, no Israeli jets have been reported as hit, with the Syrian depot believed to be massively damaged beyond repair. This incident comes just a few weeks after Syria launched rockets at Israeli planes returning from a reconnaissance mission in Lebanon actions that caused Israel to return fire and destroy the anti-aircraft batteries. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued a harsh warning after that counterattack, saying, quote, If anyone attempts to harm us, we will harm them back. End quote. Clearly, tensions are continuing to ramp up between Israel and Syria, especially now that both Iran and Hezbollah are in the mix. 
Rocket alarms blazed across central Israel earlier this morning in an apparent false alarm as reported by the IDF. The alarm, which could be heard around 3 a.m. in South Tel Aviv, Cholon, Bat Yam, and Atzur, comes just days after tensions with Gaza have started to rise. On Monday, after locating a terror tunnel run by the Islamic Jihad terror group, the IDF bombed the tunnel. Nine Palestinian terrorists were reported dead, and another five were reported missing and are presumed dead. Among the terrorists killed are suspected Palestinian Islamic Jihad commanders and Hamas naval unit members. The tunnel they were building stretched from Khan Yunis in Gaza to Kibbutz Kisufim in Israel. The Iron Dome has now been set up in the area, and construction on the underground barrier wall around Gaza has been stalled due to suspected retaliation attacks on the workers. Despite earlier aligning with Gulf nations like Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the UAE against Qatar for its support for terrorism, the United States is now seemingly pulling a 180 and has approved a $1.1 billion contract with the tiny Arab Peninsula. United States Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is looking to build ties with the Qatari nation instead of stoking the fire in order to create a more united front against growing Iranian influence in the region. The deal Secretary Tillerson signed is in service to Qatar's F-15 QA fighter jets by building ground facilities and protected bunkers for them. According to the State Department, quote, Qatar is an important force for political stability and economic progress in the Persian Gulf region. Our mutual defense interests anchor our relationship, and the Qatar Emory Air Force plays a predominant role in Qatar's defense, end quote. To the same end, Secretary Tillerson visited both Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and Doha in Qatar last month. We're getting closer to Daniel 10. Whether or not this will bring us closer to a Gog and Magog scenario as a possibility, we can only speculate. But it's certainly bringing us to Daniel 10 conflict between Israel and Iran. It has happened the first time. Benjamin Netanyahu has issued warnings that there will be further attacks of this kind if Iran attempts to deploy within striking distance of Israel, setting up again a peripheral zone, a security zone of 40 kilometers. The strikes took place very rapidly. A uh, total of five missiles have been fired. It is almost certain that the United States was pre-warned that the attacks were coming. But now the Rubicon has been crossed. The red military conflict between Iran and Israel has taken place. Not sponsored conflict. Not Israel attacking Iranian surrogates or counter-attacking Iranian surrogates. Hezbollah and Sultan. This is a direct conflict between the IDF and Iranian military forces. First time it has happened. Again, we are coming close to Daniel 10. As we always issue the caveat, whether or not there are two battles of Gog and Magog, the one at the end of the millennium and another one prefiguring it or foreshadowing it, that we'll see it rep recapitulated after the millennial reign of Christ, there are different views. Our personal disposition is to think there are two battles of Gog and Magog, although we cannot be dogmatic. But Daniel 10, we can certainly be dogmatic, and there has indeed been a conflict this week in prophecy. Remember, this week in prophecy, the first week of December, 2017. Formal, official, direct hostility, military action, conflict between Israel and Iran, with the Israelis killing a dozen Iranians in a series of missile attacks on an Iranian position on the outskirts of Damascus, this week in prophecy. Let us continue. In the diplomatic rapprochement between Russia and the regime of Assad, the Turkish spokesman Ibrahim Kalin has stated that these three nations are daring tours regarding Syria. Now, considering the fact that Syria is ostensibly on the side of NATO, the United States and the West, and has been in conflict with the Assad regime, now we are beginning to see a shift in Erdogan's position. It is a very, very confused situation. Turkey is playing both sides of the equation. They're standing on both sides of the fence. On one hand, they are on a diplomatic level in bed with Putin's backed Assad regime 
and the Iranian-backed Assad regime. At the same time, at the same time, they're standing with NATO, allowing military operations, some of them from Insulik Air Base, some of them American, to take place against the Assad regime. Erdogan obviously has an agenda, and it is an agenda of his own. This week in prophecy. Yes, it may indeed be paving the way to a Gog and Magog scenario. In the opinion of many people, they may or may not be correct. But something is obviously, obviously happening. And it's something unique this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, there was a very angry reaction from the Palestinian Authority. When the noted Kuwaiti journalist, and he's a major journalistic figure in Kuwait, Abdul al Haddad stated that Israel has a right to exist in its homeland and it cannot be called an occupying presence. He said this at a speech at the Middle East Media Research Institute. <coughs> While the border, dis the uh, boycott, disinvestment, and sanctions movement is trying to gain international momentum to the point where this very prominent journalist who could have only said it with the backing of the emir and the government of Kuwait, that Israel is not an occupying power and does have a right to exist in that land. Quite a dilemma for the Palestinian Authority. Who are this week in prophecy kicking up a fuss following reports that this depends, Vice President of the United States confirmed that Mr. Trump, President Trump, is still planning to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. There are also alternative reports that he is planning to delay further the moving of the embassy, but to declare Israel has sovereignty over the entire city. The Arab League has issued a warning saying that this will trigger violence for the United States to close the diplomatic office of the Palestinian Authority in Washington and to cease all American funding of the pro-terrorist Palestinian Authority. Their media is this week in prophecy playing a pop song and pop music video. and calling for the murder of Jews. These are people the American taxpayer is giving money to, who have a diplomatic office, who are fermenting, aiding, abetting, supporting the cause of terror. Why are we doing this? Now, as we pointed out, there is already an American consulate in East Jerusalem and in West Jerusalem, a large consulate facility that without any major modification could function as an embassy. Part of the embassy functions could remain or would need to remain in intelligence simply because the headquarters of the Israeli military, the Rosh Mate, the chief of staff's office, and the headquarters of the Mossad and Israeli intelligence are all in Tel Aviv. Thus, the military attaché's office and other defense-related functions of the American embassy could not relocate to Jerusalem anyway, but at least the address could formally move to West Jerusalem, which was the capital of Israel before 1967. This is simply the whinging of the Islamic Arab world. It would set no precedent. The facility is already there, already owned and operated by the United States, already functional for diplomatic purposes. But it would just give them a reason to riot, kill, and hate. Let us hope and pray that Mr. Trump will make good on his word and relocate the embassy, as Congress has already long ago appropriated the money recognizing Israel as the country whose capital is Jerusalem, this week in prophecy. 
And beyond the walls of the United Nations, our president is working tirelessly to strengthen the historic friendship between the United States and Israel. I'm pleased to report today that America's support for Israel's security is at a record level today. And while for the past 20 years, Congress and successive administrations have expressed a willingness to move our embassy, as we speak, President Donald Trump is actively considering when and how to move the American embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, President Trump is weighing up whether to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, a move opposed by Palestine and Arab nations as well. The U.S. State Department is concerned that moving the embassy could lead to violent protests. Park so Yon reports. Palestine has criticized U.S. President Donald Trump's plans to consider moving the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The Arab League, consisting of 22 Arabic states, has also warned that the transfer of the U.S. Embassy could fuel Arabic extremism and lead to violent protests. Trump's adviser, Jerry Kushner, says the U.S. President still hasn't made his final decision over the embassy. He's still uh, looking at a lot of different facts and that mm. when he makes his decision, uh, he'll be the one to want to tell you, not me. So, uh, so he'll, he'll, he'll make sure he does that at the right time. No U.S. president has ever recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel since 1948, when Israel was created. Palestine says the eastern part of the city is Palestinian territory and that relocating the embassy to Jerusalem is the equivalent of recognizing the city as Israel's capital. Admitting and uh, recognizing uh, uh, East Jerusalem as the, uh, the capital of Jerusalem and moving the embassy to Jerusalem, that means they are going to demolish totally the two-state solution, which is totally against the uh, UN resolution and against the uh, uh, American calls for uh, having a just peace and two-state solution. On the other hand, Israelis say the decision to move the embassy has come later than expected. I think he waited too long. He should have done it immediately when he became the president. Israel has occupied East Jerusalem since 1967 and claimed that Jerusalem is a unified capital. Palestine, on the other hand, are hoping that the eastern sector of the city will be their future capital. White House National Security Advisor H. R. McMaster has said that the relocation will create momentum to broker a peace agreement in the Middle East. But Middle East experts say moving the embassy will make a peace agreement more difficult. The U.S. Department of State is also concerned that the transfer of the U.S. Embassy will spark violent protests against U.S. offices. Park Soyan, Arirang News. Also on the diplomatic front this week in prophecy, Jordan will not allow Israel to return its ambassador to Amman until Israeli security guards who shot two Iranians are put on trial. The Israeli embassy was attacked during the riots on the Temple Mount, and in the process, one Israeli was seriously injured. One Israeli was seriously injured in the Israeli diplomatic compound and embassy facility in Amman. In self-defense, the Israelis opened fire. But now there is a demand to placate Palestinian Arab Muslim opinion inside of Jordan, where 70 to 75 percent of the population are Arab Muslim Palestinians, that the Jordanian government will demand the trial of these Israeli security guards, which Israel has not been willing to do. Israel has stated that unless there is a full restoration of diplomatic normalcy in its relationship with Jordan, joint water pro projects, especially the Jordan Dead Sea Water Project, designed to save the Dead Sea from further evaporation due to the industrial removal of high salines, potash, and other minerals from the Dead Sea Basin, will be jeopardized. This is known as the Dead Sea Water Convergence Project involving both Israel and Jordan jointly. Jordan is going to push ahead without Israel, according to some voices in Jordan. 
this would be very difficult to do territorially, technologically, and financially. The diplomatic row also places in some doubt the gas deal between Israel and Jordan. The Jordanians are afraid of being reliant upon Israel for natural gas or for its water. Now, the water shortage and the water crisis in Jordan is absolutely massive and nothing short of massive. <laughs> Pilgrims bathe in the Jordan River at Bethany, 50 kilometers west of the capital Amman. Believed to be the spot where John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the Jordan River is under threat. Almost all of the river's water has been diverted and just 5% of the original flow remains. 200 kilometers to the south, the Jordan River ends in the Dead Sea, where water levels are declining one meter every year. A plan to save the Dead Sea, funded by the World Bank, has the backing of capitals in Jordan, Israel and Palestine. In December 2013, the three countries signed an agreement to construct a desalination plant close to Aqaba on the Red Sea, providing water for both Jordan and Israel with the latter in turn guaranteeing water to Palestine. The plant would send the reject brine north to the Dead Sea. The proposal was to build a project with multiple objectives. So first, it will save the Dead Sea. Second, it will bring prosperity, so there will be direct uh, investment in, into the region and the third one will be uh, promoting peace and promoting dialogue between the people. But rather than investing 10 billion dollars in the Red Sea Dead Sea project, EcoPeace believes Jordan must first address water losses at home. We have unaccounted for water, at least in Jordan, it's between 40 to 60 percent, 40 in Amman and 60 in the rural area unaccounted for water, so it's almost half of the water gets lost. We still have a major agricultural sector in the region that is not sustainable. We have to shift a little bit, to move, start to shift dependency from one big sector, which is agriculture, that today is producing less than 4% of the GDP in Jordan, and in Israel it's less than 1%, and yet it consumes, consumes about 50% of the resources of the region to diverse economy where agriculture will become a, a, an essential sector where it produces what we need to eat rather than what we need to export for income. As one of the most water scarce countries in the world, Jordan needs a solution to its water crisis. The price of water is astronomical. Agricultural development is nearly impossible in much of Jordan and the situation is worsening. They desperately need cooperation with Israel in the area of water engineering. But again, King Abdullah finds himself in a precarious situation as the rightful Hashemite king of the Jordanian nation as a kingdom, but with a Palestinian Arab Muslim popular majority demographically. This is continuing. It is not in the interest of Jordan economically to continue to allow diplomatic obstruction. Israel, a nation founded to establish and guarantee the rights of Jews, is denying the rights to Jews simply based on the need to pander by virtue of coalition politics to extremist religious parties needed to maintain a coalition government. We have stated many times that proportional representation is the least democratic form of democracy if one wants to call it democracy at all. It has wreaked havoc 
in Britain and in Germany, but it has made a complete shambles of the political climate in Israel. And now poor Rebecca Floyd is the victim, a daughter, Jewish daughter, of Holocaust survivors. In the latest bout, she was given a one-month visa instead of a normal three-month visa, all because the Ministry of Interior is in the hands of the ultra-Orthodox. It's going on, and that the Lord raises his hand against the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox religious parties, trying to groom good favor with rabbinic authorities at the expense of not preaching the gospel to the Jews and at the expense of the plight of Jewish believers. They don't want to offend rabbis, so they would rather offend Christ or organizations such as Bridges for Peace. No Christ, no peace. We are firm supporters of Israel and its right to exist. But we are firm supporters of the local body of Christ in Israel. Their right to be Jews and to live in that land as any other Jew. Nearly all Jewish believers serve in the army. A disproportionately high amount of them volunteer for combat brigades, while ultra-Orthodox Jews sit in yeshivas or run away to Brooklyn. Yet they have rights, but Jewish believers do not. It is a national indictment and a shame and a disgrace that of all the democracies in the world, the only one with an official policy of discriminating against Jews is Israel. This doesn't even make sense, but it is the reality, and it's become a reality once more this week in prophecy. Let us continue. The boycott, disinvestment, and sanctions movement has been animated by the Muslim Brotherhood, by the Palestinian Authority, and by the international left. In the USA, one of their fronts is an organization called AstroTurf. They are also tied in Israel to the idea that Al-Aqsa uh, is in danger. The Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount. They spread lies, they spread rumors, they spread fear. This movement is absurd, but it is losing power in the Persian Gulf. It is losing power among the Saudis, but it is gaining power in the West because of the left in many quarters. It is ridiculous and it is absurd. Once again, we ask the question, why in light of the persecution of Christians throughout the Middle East with the Christian population of the Middle East being decimated due to Islamic radicalism. Why is there no boycott, disinvestment, or sanction policy against the Islamic countries who are mistreating Arab Christians? A very good question. Unfortunately, this policy has come into certain liberal Protestant denominations. Even in the United States, the Presbyterian Church in America. God will raise his hand against them. We again point to Obadiah 15. He who keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He ne lo yanum valo yishan shomer Israel. But we ought not to make the following mistake. Pro Zionist evangelical Christian organizations who will distance themselves, turn their backs on Jewish believers and on the body of Yeshua, the body of Messiah in Israel, who have a published on an evangelistic policy, some even embracing the lie of dual covenant theology that Jews can be saved without a saving faith in Christ. And I'm speaking to people who support John Hagee. They are no less dangerous and no less inimical to the true cause of Christ for Israel and the Jews than the opponents of Zionism who try to make anti-Zionism and the support of BDS a 
a Christian cause. In prophecy. This week in prophecy technically was the end of last week. The Michael Aoun, Lebanese army chief, appeased or appeared to be appeasing and even defending Hezbollah, Iranian and Syrian backed, as necessary to resist Israel. There is no Israeli aggression towards Lebanon. Any action Israel takes in Lebanon against Hezbollah is in self-defense or retaliation for attacks against Israel or surrogate attacks from, Israel, from Iran via Hezbollah launched from Lebanon. There is no Israeli threat to Lebanon. Israel occupied southern Lebanon temporarily in self-defense to stop Katushas from falling on Galilee. When the Christian population was driven out, the Phalanges were driven out, it was the Israelis, not the Europeans, the Israelis who accepted Maronite Roman Catholic and other Phalangist Christians from Lebanon as refugees when the Muslims drove them out of the homes in which they'd lived for generations. In alliance with the Assad regime, that is Alawite, a form of Shia Islam in Syria, and then in connection or in association with its Hezbollah puppets all the way to the Mediterranean. This will be very dangerous, and as we looked at last week, the policy of trying to appease Turkey by the Trump administration, by ceasing support and armaments to the Kurds is counterproductive to the interests of the United States. This week in prophecy in Germany, Roger Waters, a former member of the pop band, the rock band Pink Floyd, had his television broadcast canceled on a publicly supported WDR German TV because of his anti-Israel activities that many people, in fact most people, familiar with what he's actually saying, who are known to us considered to be not only anti-Israel, but even anti-Semitic. It's publicly funded and it was canceled. We consider this to be a victory. All right, speaking of movies, a Canadian Jewish filmmaker who's making a documentary on the anti-Zionist Pink Floyd band member, Roger Waters, says that the industry is now shunning his new project. Ian Halperin has been making films about celebrities like the Kardashian family and Michael Jackson for years, but now he's turning his attention to a Jewish cause. Halperin was informed by the director of ISGAP, an anti-Semitism monitoring group, about Waters' distasteful rhetoric, and what Halperin's found since his research has started is upsetting. He says he's interviewed musicians who've worked with Waters who say that the rock star has been anti-Jewish for more than 25 years. But that's not the only thing that's alarming the director. He's finding also that the media likes to avoid this topic. Halperin says that his documentary on Brangelina was covered in around 3,000 articles when it was announced, but Wish You Weren't Here, as the film is called, is receiving essentially no mainstream media coverage. Some editors have told him the subject is too small, but Halperin's not buying it. He says that Waters has the highest grossing Oslo tour of all time, and he's worried that the mainstream media's silence on Waters is equally motivated by anti-Semitic sentiments. On a personal note, and it's just a matter of personal taste, I've never thought Roger Waters was even a very dynamic musician. I never thought he was the real talent in Pink Floyd at all. Uh, I always thought it was, was David Gilmore. And I think that the post-Pink Floyd solo careers proved that Roger Waters was just along for the ride and benefited from the talent of others. That is only my view. Others may differ. But what is clear is the hypocrisy as if Palestinian Muslims are the victims, when in fact it is the Israelis who are the victims. They are not an occupying power. He exploited or attempted to exploit the Pink Floyd film and recording of a wall as a parody to Israel's barrier to stop Islamic terrorism. Other pop musicians, such as most recently Nick Cave, Eric Burden, Paul McCartney, and others have played in Israel and not observed these boycotts. But this week in prophecy, finally someone stood up to Roger Water, a man who many people 
in the pop music industry even considered to be a has-been who never really was. Let us move on. Saudi Arabia is once again on the warpath and hyper-concerned about the conflict with Iran. The technical arrest for corruption of many senior Saudi princes and other officials who are being held in the Ritz Hotel largely ended. There were some indictments, some dropping of charges. Nonetheless, after the resignation of Lebanese Prime Minister Saeed Hariri from Israel in a very precarious, precarious position, as well as Saudi Arabia, ultimately it'll draw the United States even further into that equation that is presently attempting to defuse. The Kurds, the Saudis, the Israelis, and the Americans and the West need to line up and stop Iran. They need to outface Mr. Putin. Now here becomes the complication. Mr. Putin has always tried to destabilize the Middle East in order to drive up artificially the price of Russian oil and natural gas. Saudi Arabia, however, has a common interest with Russia, even though they are in opposition to Russia over Syria and Russians alliances, de facto alliances, with Iran. What is it? The Saudis they can still control OPEC, but OPEC cannot do what it once did economically or financially to the degree it did and can no longer command the kind of diplomatic leverage it once did. Again, it's forcing Saudi Arabia to look more moderately. This week in prophecy, Israeli researchers, biomedical scientists, and genetic scientists have debunked the transgender craze that is sweeping much of the West, including Britain and America. Anyone in a Western society is caught up in the transgender phenomena and the movement virtually that it has spurned. Israel has entered this contest in a scientific playing field. It's looking to play its role, some would say, as a kind of light to the nations, based on fact-based reality. Geneticists at the Israeli Weizmann Institute of Science, a major research facility in Israel, one of the world's leading scientific institutions recently published a study showing how many biological differences there are between the male and female of the human species. Professor Shmuel Petrokovsky and Dr. Moran Gershoni studied 20,000 genes, sorting them by sex and searching the differences in expression in each tissue. We live in an age where we are told it's an age of science, yet scientific reality is expected to be suspended. There are X and Y chromosomes. Having somebody surgically altered to resemble the opposite sex will not change the DNA in a single cell. Yet we have laws requiring teachers in schools to call children by female names or male names if they wish to be identified as members of the opposite sex without any reference to scientific reality biogenetically. Sufi Muslims are mystical Muslims. Think of them as the equivalent of Islam, of what hyper-charismatics are among Christians. They're mystics. And a mosque of them, 300, were murdered the, the government of General Assisi has promised retribution, nonetheless, 300 killed. We have to remember that there are moderate Muslims, but there are also expressions of Islam that are nonviolent, the Ahmadi and the Sufis, not Sunnis. Sufis are peaceful people. Ahmadis are peaceful people. They are non-radical expressions of Islamic belief. We don't agree with them theologically. We certainly see them as spiritually deceived, but we have no hostility towards them 
and we respect their rights. But this shows that moderate Muslims and moderate expressions of Islam can and will be arch targets of more radical ones. Jerusalem does not even appear in the Islamic scriptures. Some later Islamic scholars identified Al-Quds, a place called Al-Quds as Jerusalem, but initially there was no universal agreement among us, even among ancient Islamic scholars. An indigenous revival among any British people was in the late 1940s with the preaching of Duncan Campbell in the Hebrides Islands. Now, unlike the counterfeit revivals we've seen from Toronto and Pensacola and Lakeland and other such garbage and counterfeits, what transpired in the Hebrides was real under the preaching of Duncan Campbell. You can go there today, there are still many saved Christians and the repercussions of that revival are seen and felt to this very day. It was a powerful, powerful move of God that has been studied by many church historians. Not something that can be replicated or imitated in a formulaic sense, but certainly an example of the power of prayer. And the power of what happens when people repent and seek God and beg him to pour out his spirit. It is my personal view that the reaction to the defeat of Hillary Clinton, having lost the election democratically and electorally, by generating a legal response attempting to impeach President Trump for things for which there is no real evidence of his guilt, by the Republican Party establishment, who he defeated, and by the utterly corrupt Democratic Party, whose own former chairman, Donna Brazil, admits is corrupt, are politically motivated. But as we read in Daniel, it is the Lord who establishes kings and removes them. I believe the Lord, in his grace, has established Mr. Trump as a leader at this time, but we also know from Daniel 10 and Daniel 12. There is more, much more to come. The question is when and how, and how the Saudis and Persian Gulf Sunni Arab nations will factor into that equation. And also, what the actions of the American and British governments and NATO will be. That is This Week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening. Hoping to be with you from Singapore next week. God bless.